So this passage, if you have your Bible in front of you, the the sort of subtitle is The Death of Jesus, and that's in fact what we are going to be uh, looking at. Uh, The death of Jesus, but of course not the end of Jesus. Uh, Resurrection is coming. Uh, It is, however, the end of his mission. Uh, He was sent to earth uh, with some things to accomplish, and uh, what this passage uh, tells us very clearly is that he did in fact accomplish them. Uh, He wasn't behind schedule. He wasn't scrambling to get things done. Everything was going according to plan. In fact, uh, you can see from the words that he speaks on the cross, uh, one of them will be in our text, but I want to show you two, uh, that is very clear that the mission is done. So here's John 1930. Uh, He says, it is finished. The things that I've come to do, it it is now complete. And then in our passage, he says, last words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And there is a sense of victory in those words. Uh, It says, he says it with a loud voice. And so Jesus in his death isn't uh, submitting to something, falling into something, isn't something that he couldn't overcome. He is actually accomplishing everything that he intended to do. And that's what I want to spend our time looking at this morning. What are the things that Jesus accomplished and what do we see here as Luke uh, records them? So let's read our passage, and then we're going to look at the three things that, uh, that we see here. So here's verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And that last verse, I think, is a good way to approach the text. Uh, All his followers, all the people who had been part of his ministry watched these things, watched the, the events of the cross and the events of his death. And the question we might ask, well, what, what were they seeing? What were the things that stood out to them and made an impact uh, for those who had followed Jesus and knew Jesus. And I think there's at least three things, and uh, I want to give each of them, uh, I think there's three, you might say, symbols. Uh, Three things that we see in the text that are significant in terms of the accomplishments of Jesus. Uh, So I want to name those things, uh, each one in turn, and then then give the meaning. So for example, here's the first one. Uh, What we see here, what they would have seen is darkness. And this darkness, uh, I think, was uh, symbolic of uh, this greater truth that God isn't angry anymore. He was no longer angry with his people, with those who have faith. And uh, we see this in the text itself. Uh, Let's begin with the the darkness, the literal darkness. Verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. Uh, this, This was a literal a darkness, uh, symbolic also, as we'll see, but if you were there at that time, it would have been dark. Uh, we're not exactly sure how. Uh, it was a supernatural darkness, but a literal darkness, uh, and at the time when the sun would have been at its highest peak, so uh, those hours, six hour to the ninth hour, was noon till 3 p.m. So it should have been very bright, it's an area of the world, a lot of sun, and yet it was dark. In case you're wondering, uh, they can look back and figure out it was not an eclipse, Uh, The moon wasn't in the right place at the right time for for that to happen. Uh, Other historians, not just in the Gospels, mention this darkness, so it was a real thing that that actually happened. Uh, But the importance of it was much greater than simply that the sun was was clouded. The question is why? What what was this symbolic of? Well, darkness in the Bible uh, is associated with a a bunch of different things that you probably can just uh, think of, even if you haven't looked at the text themselves, evil. Right? Darkness and evil are associated, sorrow and darkness, and divine judgment and darkness. Uh, here's one text from the Old Testament, uh, Zephaniah 1.15, where we get all of these together. Zephaniah speaking about a day to come, a day of judgment, and you see all of these things together. He says, a day of wrath is this day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. He's speaking about the judgment of God, but also the sorrow, the devastation, uh, the evil that was associated with sin, and so it all was kind of wrapped up 
uh, together. So this darkness was literal, but it was also symbolic of what was actually going on at the cross. And so that's the question. What, what actually was happening uh, during this, this time of darkness to Jesus? And there were really two things that were happening for him. He was experiencing the wretchedness of all the sin of all of humanity for all time upon himself. And he was experiencing the wrath that would come, the anger of God that would come, the judgment of God that would come because of that sin. So uh, the reality of him experiencing this sin is something that's difficult to kind of grasp, but it's very clear in Scripture. Okay, we see this kind of over and over. Isaiah talks about the fact that the iniquity, our sin would be laid upon the, the suffering servant. Galatians talks about Jesus becoming a curse for us to save us from the curse. But here's 2 Corinthians 5, 21, which is one of the clearest. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That phrasing uh, is, I think, helpful for us to understand what exactly was going on. It's not just that Jesus uh, was coming to understand sin. Uh, there's kind of this difference, right, between knowing sin, knowing evil, knowing the, what, what sin is and what it looks like. There, there's a difference between that and experiencing it. It says, the one who knew no sin, Jesus who had no sin in him, completely pure, completely sinless, he was, he was becoming sin. There was the sense in which he was absorbing all of the corruption and sin of humanity. Uh, you could think of it, uh, for example, like a, like a smoker's lung, right? Absorbing all of the toxins, all of the tar, all of the carcinogens, so that by the end, it's no longer pink like a lung should be, but, but black and wretched. That, that's Jesus, but in his soul. Uh, the thing that I, I think of in terms of our experience of it Probably there's been a time in your life when you have uh, been somewhere or engaged in something or done something where you come away feeling kind of dirty, if you know that experience, where you, it was wrong for some reason, it wasn't good for some reason, uh, maybe you didn't really know it would be that bad and you were there and, and you, you wanted to leave right away, maybe in your sin, you gave in to temptation, went farther and farther into the darkness, but at the end of that experience, you felt, you felt corrupt, you felt darker, you felt the sin. Now imagine that experience, but times all of the sin of humanity, all, all of the evil all of the abuse, all of the corruption, all of the lustfulness, all of the idolatry, ev everything that every human being has engaged in poured out upon Christ. So that he felt that darkness. He became that darkness, even though he committed none of it. That was what was going on under the veil of darkness. But the other part is that he was experiencing all of the just consequence of that sin. This, the Bible speaks about in terms of the, the wrath of God or the anger of God. It's not a term that, uh, you know, we use that often, but it, again, it's very clear in Scripture. So here's Romans 2, one example of it. It says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You see the connection there. The wrath of God is the judgment of God, the anger of God. It's, it's not the way we talk, but I would, uh, I think it is the way that we understand a judgment. Uh, for example, I remember hearing an interview with a district attorney somewhere in the States, and he was just being interviewed talking about how he uh, figures out the sentencing that he is going to try to petition the court for. You know, someone's been convicted of uh, aggravated assault. What's the sentence that you pursue as a district attorney? And they were asking, like, what's your motivation? Is it to try to deter future crime? Which is what we often associate, right? You get a certain consequence, and then other people will see that and not do it. And his response was a little surprising to me. He said, well, that, uh, if that happens, that's great, but that's not really my motivation. He said, my motivation, I'm thinking of the victim. I'm thinking of the one who was assaulted, or, or the family whose son was killed, or, or all of those who have been hurt by this crime. I'm thinking to myself, what will satisfy their anger? 
What will satisfy their sense of hurt, their sense of injustice, their, their cry for justice? What will that look like? Five years, 10 years, what is the, the right amount? And that really is a picture of, of wrath, of the, the judgment of God, that there have been crimes. 746, he cries out in anguish. Right? Not, just, not just from the pain of the nails, not just from the, the discomfort of breathing and all the whippings, but because of the anguish of what he's enduring under the wrath of God. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's never been separated from the Father. For eternity past, he's been united, Son and Father together, the Trinity. And yet here in this moment, God turns his back. Because Jesus has become sin. He's experiencing the anguish, the torment, that, that we deserve. The death of Jesus was the final act necessary to save us from this, this wrath of God that we deserve. And we see it spoken of very clearly in Romans 5, 8 and 9, where it says this, For God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. This is what the darkness signifies. That Jesus did the thing that was necessary for us to be freed from it. For us to be able to step out from under that, that weight of God's wrath and judgment. And for us to be able to know, for those who have faith, to believe that, that, that we, we are no longer under that penalty. That God no longer looks upon us with, with anger, with a sense of justice. It's, it's been paid. So, so what is the takeaway from this first thing that we see, the darkness? Well, for those who uh, don't have faith, I think something needs to be said here, which is that I hope that, that this scene awakens you to the idea that there is, in fact, judgment coming. You may not feel like you are deserving of the wrath of God, but, but we should note that criminals rarely feel like they're deserving of punishment. If, if you go to most prisons... Uh, everyone's innocent in prison, just so you know. They'll tell you, I'm innocent, don't deserve this, right? I got a raw deal. There, there are very few criminals that see clearly the extent of their sin. So it's not, a very, it's not a very helpful or accurate measurement to see whether you feel guilty. The question is, what does the court say? What does the evidence say? What does the judge say? And the question you should be asking is, on that day when all of the deeds of your life, all of the the things you've done in secret, thought in secret, will be exposed. What, what will the verdict be? It's very clear that there will be judgment. But praise God that we see here there's an answer for that. For those of us who have faith, though, for those of us who've seen this clearly by the grace of God, confessed our sin, claimed the, the work of Jesus, that he has, he has atoned for it, what, what should this scene remind us of? Well, it should remind us very clearly that God is no longer angry with us. All the wrath has been poured out. The darkness tells us. The, the, the cries of Jesus on the cross tell us that all of the anger of God has been spent. That the fancy word is he has propitiated himself for us, borne all the wrath of God, the sacrifice, which means now that as we think of God, we should not think of him in this light. This moment of, of anger being poured out, now when he looks at us, even though we sin, this is the amazing thing, even though today we sin, even though there's still continual sin, he now sees us in light of the righteousness of Christ. Which means there's, there's no longer any anger. There's no longer any, there's no frustration. There's no disappointment. There, there's no disapproval from God for those of us who are in Christ. He doesn't look down upon us even in our continual failures and, and think to himself, oh, again? He, he's, he's not like the people in our lives that have real difficulty actually forgiving and loving us because we are all sinners and we're trying to love each other in a good way. We, we can never do it, but God does it perfectly, which means that we can bask in, in the radiance of his love and his mercy and his approval because of this, because of what we see here with Jesus. I think this is a tough thing for us to really feel. And so it's helpful sometimes to, to look to other lesser examples. To, to, to access this feeling. And one of it uh, that I thought of comes from a, a movie, uh, Dune 1. 
I went and saw Dune 2. It was great. But I'm thinking of Dune 1. Uh, there's a great father-son relationship uh, in that movie. Uh, there's, there's Leto, who is the, like the king, right? The leader of the Atreides family and clan. This, and his son, Paul. And uh, there's a great scene where, where they're speaking about basically Paul's uh, hesitancy, reluctance to one day assume the throne, right? To take on the, the mantle of family leadership. And he says to his dad, he says, you know what? What if, what if I'm not the future of the family, right? Saying, what if, what if I can't do it or I won't do it? And, uh, and his dad looks at him and he has this, this moment. He says, he says, look, your grandfather, right? Your grandfather said that great men don't seek to lead, but they are called to it and they answer it. And then he looked at his son, he said, but if your answer is no, and in that moment, uh, the son, he kind of breathes in, right? You, you can feel the weight of, of, of what is his dad going to say if he doesn't do the thing that everyone's expecting him to do. His dad says, if your answer is no, he says, um, you will still have been the one thing that I've always needed you to be, which is my son. And, and, and you see just this relief flow out of the, uh, over the son. He's just, he knows in that moment, no matter what he does, his dad is going to love him. And, and it just frees him. It's this beautiful, intimate moment between father and son. Something that's difficult for us to experience in our earthly lives, but is just a glimmer of the grace and the mercy and the approval of God the Father for us. Because all of our sins have been taken care of. Because all of the judgment has been poured out on his son. And so, so we need to move forward in our faith knowing God isn't angry. Any moment of every day, when you feel that sense of disapproval, you need to remind yourself there is no disapproval from God. He loves us. And it leads to the second thing that we see in this uh, sequence. Uh, the symbol is the torn curtain. And what does the torn curtain tell us? It tells us that we can draw near to God. Right, kind of connected. So look, look at this. is just in one half line of verse 45. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Very brief. Uh, if you're not familiar with what this curtain is, you probably just breeze right by this, right? I don't know what this curtain is. It's kind of interesting, weird. Uh, but if you know what it's talking about, this is incredibly significant. And so just to make sure we understand, uh, this is speaking about a curtain that was in the temple. The temple where the Jewish people came to meet with God. And so I just want to show you a picture so we can kind of get in our mind. Here's the temple complex. Uh, Herod's temple is what they called it. The big structure in the middle uh, was the temple itself. And this is where the priests would go. And that building was divided into two. And so the next slide kind of has from above. You can see there's the longer rectangle part. That's the holy place. And then that line is the curtain. And then there's this, this square part, which is the most holy place. And this was where the presence of God would dwell. In the Old Testament, this is where uh, they would put the, the Ten Commandments and all of the, the sacred, holy things that God had done. And this is where the priests would go once a year, only once a year, only the high priest, always with some of the blood of the sacrifice of a lamb to go and would atone for the people. You, you couldn't enter that, that space without a sacrifice or you, you would die because God was there. And he is holy. And any sinful people, person entering in that place, it, it, would be, it would be death. And so the priest would be able to go into the presence of God. That was the wondrous thing, but it was not very often. And the curtain was there to separate the two spaces. And, and the, the thing we need to be clear about is why the curtain was there. You might think it's because um, God wanted to protect what was inside from, from the outside world. Because that's often how we think of sacred things special things. Every museum, right? The most special thing. I saw the Mona Lisa one time. There's a lot of protective measures around the Mona Lisa, right? They didn't want some idiot with a coffee spilling it on the, on the Mona Lisa because it's, it's special. So you got to protect the special things. But that curtain is not protecting what was inside. It's protecting what was outside because God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. The, the, the perfect 
pure holiness of God and sinful humanity couldn't bear to be in his presence without, without dying. And so the curtain was there to veil, to protect us. And by his grace, he dwelt within the people, but always had to come in, like I said, the, holy, uh, the, the high priest, whole ritual washings, cleansed to go in once. And now, th- think of this. Think of all the priests going about their duties. This was the, the, the day before Passover. Big, big festival, big weekend, a lot of expectation. They had a lot of work to do. And all of a sudden, this curtain, um, Matthew says it was torn from top to bottom, which is physically impossible for any one or two people. This, was thick, this, this fabric was as thick, it says, as a man's hand, tightly woven. There were priests all over the place. Even if someone had come in with a ladder, right, and with, with a sword, tried to hack away, they would have seen it. That's not what happened. They were just doing their thing, and all of a sudden, torn apart, and they were looking directly into the Holy of Holies, where God dwelled, where they were not allowed to see, not allowed to be, and they weren't dying. This, this, this would have blown everyone's minds. This, this would have been inconceivable. This was even possible, and, and yet it was possible, and it was directly related to what Christ was doing. That because he had atoned for the sins of the people, now they had, they had access to God in a way that they never had before. So what did this torn curtain mean? One of the things, which we're going to talk about on Good Friday, is that the Old Testament sacrificial system was done. It was no longer needed, we're going to talk a lot about it. The blood of Jesus was, was the final sacrifice. Praise Jesus. But today what I want to focus on is this idea that now we have an access that we didn't before. That, that we can draw near to God in a way that we couldn't before. Why? Again, because now something is different about those of us who have faith. That we are no longer cloaked in sin. We are cloaked in the righteousness of God. And so when God looks at us, even now, even though we are not yet fully made Holy as we will be in heaven, God sees us through Christ. And so what he says to us, to us is, is the way is open. Draw near. You don't have to be afraid. You don't, you don't have to be worried. You, 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 can, you can boldly come into the presence of God. This is uh, what it says in Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 10, starting in 19. Therefore, brothers, we have, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. Look at, the, look at the, uh, what it's associated with. Look, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure with water. The, the emphasis there, what I want to see, we, can, we have confidence to enter now into the presence of God, a confidence they didn't have before. They were nervous about entering the presence of God. You've probably heard the stories. When the high priest entered the holy place, they would tie a rope to his his ankle in case he died when he was there. They'd have to pull him out. No, you wouldn't go in to get him. Then you would die. There was this sense of trepidation, rightly so. They were sinful people, a holy God. You can't enter his presence. And now, he says, with confidence, we can what? Draw near to God. How? Through the Spirit of God. We are talked about, for those of us who are believers now, as temples of the Holy Spirit. That, that picture that I showed you, that, that's us. That now he dwells within us. And in prayer, in, in, in meditation, in reading, we can be in the presence of God. This is what Jesus accomplished for us. The question that I have for those here who have faith is, are we doing this? Are we actually drawing near to him? Because the pattern of humanity is, is one of taking these kinds of relationships for granted. Wouldn't you say? There's something about us in our sin and our hard-heartedness that, that we often establish relationships that are meant to be one of great intimacy and yet then we neglect them. You see this in friendships. You see this in marriages. We'll come together, pledge our lives to each other. The, the way is open, right? She said yes. He said yes. We're, we're bonded together. We're husband and wife. And yet then we spend the next 10 years not talking to each other or not seeking to know each other. 
It's a sad reality that many people 20 years into marriage are, are less close than they were when they were dating. Why is that? There's a thousand reasons. But, but it has everything to do with our nature as human beings. That we tend to assume that relationships are just going to grow because the door is open. Literally, there are doors open in our homes and we don't walk through them to go and spend time with each other, to know each other. Literally, there is a, there's a way open to God and we don't spend the time. We think it's just going to happen. There's lots of times when I speak with people, I've experienced this myself, where if someone asks me, how, how was your relationship with the Lord? You'd say, it feels, feels distant. I, I don't feel the sense of his presence the way maybe I did. And, and the answer to why that is, is never anything to do with God. It's always to do with us. That we haven't, we haven't taken advantage of what Jesus did. That the curtain is torn, and we, we can daily, hourly, boldly go into his presence. Come, come with our burdens. Come with our, with our anxieties. Come with our challenges. Come with our temptations. Lord, help me, please. And to know that he's there, that he wants us to draw near, that we're not a burden to him. The torn curtain should give us a sense of exhilaration that the thing that the priest back then never even dreamed of, we can do every day. We can just step into his presence in prayer, experience his grace, experience his mercy, know him in an intimate way. It's a beautiful thing. There's a third thing here that we see that Jesus accomplished. And uh, the symbol of it, I think, is the centurion himself. And what we see in him that we can experience spiritual awakenings. Now, this centurion, uh, obviously Roman soldier in charge of uh, 100 uh, Roman soldiers, that's what it meant. Uh, he probably was the guy who was in charge of this whole operation. Probably done a lot of different crucifixions. Many times before, this was the Roman way. Uh, probably he didn't actually hold Jesus down and, and didn't nail the, the spikes. They would have had people to do that, but he was there. He was overseeing it. This was a, this was a tough man, a hard man, military man, a man of the world. There'd be no sympathy, no squeamishness in him, n- n- none of that at all. Uh, he would have been there either mocking Jesus with the other soldiers or certainly kind of smiling as they did it, right? This, this was the centurion, and, and then something happens. Whatever you're reading of this text, you have to admit something has happened for this man because now look at his words. Here's verse 47. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he's watching these things, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent, and then if you add on what uh, uh, Mark adds, Mark 15, 39, he says this, truly this man was the son of God. These are not the words of someone who is disinterested in spiritual things. These are, these are not the words of a man of the world. These are the words of, of someone who, who I would say is having a spiritual awakening. How has it happened? He's been watching these things. What has he seen? He's seen Jesus nailed to the cross and then pray for those who nailed him there. He's seen a thief uh, yelling insults at him and then one uh, saying to Jesus, remember me, your kingdom. Jesus says, you're going to be with me in paradise. He's seen these things. He's heard him cry out. My God, why have you forsaken me? It's finished. All of these words and now into your hands I commit my spirit and there's something that moved in him. How did that happen? Well, whatever is going on in this centurion, it, it must be the work of the spirit of God. If it's, if it's genuine and there's some debate, about what this means, right? Did, did this man come to faith there? Will he be a Christian later? We, we don't exactly know. But it seems evident that there is some sort of spiritual awakening because when the Holy Spirit is at work, these are the kind of things that happen. You begin to see Jesus differently. You begin to, to see life and reality differently. Uh, the Apostle Paul is probably the most dramatic example of this, right? Totally against Jesus, has an experience with him, and then everything changes. But, but that's always what actually happens. That's, that's a dramatic example of it, but that shift, that change, is always what happens when com- someone comes to faith. And, and the work of the Spirit often manifests itself in things like this, like we're seeing in this centurion, right? Often there's, there's a new understanding of Christ or a new interest in Jesus that we didn't have before. You see this, I've talked to many people like this. They begin to ask deeper questions and And what is it that's going on? Well, the Spirit is at work. Paul 
uh, speaks about this work, this, this awakening work of the Spirit in Ephesians 1, uh, 16 to 19. He's speaking to a church. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remember you my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation of the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of this glorious inheritance in the saints, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. What is Paul praying? I want for the Spirit to continue to do the thing that he did in you to begin with, right? Because it's, it's both. It's a spiritual awakening coming from death to life and then a continual uh, understanding, eyes opening to see all these things more clearly. This is the Spirit's work. This is what he does. And if it is genuine, again, we're not sure with this centurion, but if it is genuine, what this kind of thing will lead to is, is two things. One is a clear expression of faith which the centurion doesn't quite give us, right? A clear ex- expression of faith is, is the gospel, right? A confession, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I see you've died for my sins. I trust, I believe that you died for my sins and that in your resurrection, I can see that I will be resurrected. All, all of that is, is what it means to be a Christian. You see it throughout the, the New Testament that Paul is, is telling people, here's what was revealed to me first. Jesus died according to the scriptures. This, this is the thing you need to know. This is what you need to believe. It's not enough is what I'm saying, simply to have some stirrings. Lots of people have some stirrings of spiritual something, some awakening, some deep questions. But there's lots of times where people end up in ditches with other forms of spirituality, other forms forms of philosophy, other, other things. They never actually come to an understanding of Christ. That's not a genuine spiritual awakening that leads to life. That's just more darkness. For us to truly be awake and alive, we need to have clarity about Christ and and confess that the gospel is true. So so a true spiritual awakening is what Jesus is making possible because he's dying for our sins. He's breaking the bonds of sin that the spirit is about to be unleashed so that we we can see these things and confess these things and have genuine faith. But the expression of faith is the first thing. The second thing that is always part of a true spiritual awakening is a persevering of the faith. Which means that we don't just say that Jesus is Lord for a moment, but that we live like Jesus is Lord for a lifetime. And this, I think, is the interesting thing to think about for the centurion. Right? We, we don't know. I wonder when he got home, when he started telling his wife about what he saw whether it was the kind of thing that, you know, was just for a day. Could be, right? That, that they would look back on that day. Remember that day? Wasn't that, wasn't that strange? Remember that guy? What was his name? Was crucified and you had that experience. Man, that was, that was amazing. And they lived their lives like they always have. That, then it wasn't real. But if this day marked a change, a lasting change in his life, where, where other people, he, in the faith of the disciples, like Cornelius, the other centurion that's to come, where everything changes. Where people who know the centurion are like, something's different. Why are you, why are you going to meet with the disciples of that guy who died? Why are, you, why are you changing the way you live and seeking to honor God? The answer, because something is different. Because I, I know now who I am and who God is, and I can't live the same. That's, that's a, a genuine spiritual awakening. And we should see evidence of that in our lives if we are true believers. But the truth of the matter is that a lot of times what follows an apparent spiritual awakening is that we fall back to sleep. Is that there are those of us who had a moment at some point and it was grand, but lately have have not been walking with the Lord. I was thinking of this this idea of uh, spiritual awakening, whether it's true, whether it's genuine. And uh, the, the person that came to my mind um, is someone you will know. Uh, you know Kanye West. Uh, you know that he used to be one of the most successful, famous rappers really on the planet, incredibly successful, uh, sold tons of albums. And if you might remember that back around 2018, uh, he started to talk a lot about Jesus. Uh, he, he put out a record called Jesus is King. 
he started having church services at his, at his compound. And, and anyone who knew Jesus was very intrigued. I was very intrigued. What, what is going on with Kanye? A man who is known for partying and drinking and now is, is putting out records about Jesus walking with everyone. So I, I remember the, the interview that came to my mind. At the time, he did an interview with James Corden, who's a late night talk show host. And James Corden was asking Kanye about this. He was saying, Kanye, because the whole interview was Kanye talking about how he reads the Bible, how he, everything changed. So James Corden said, look, Kanye, what would you say to people who would, who would say, Kanye, I don't think this is real. Like, when I look at the way you used to live, and I look now, like, I'm not, is, I don't, is this real? Like, this whole new thing, I, I, don't, I just don't buy it. And, and Kanye's response was something that just jumped out at me. So I, I looked it up. Here's, here's how he responded. His answer was this to James Corden. He said, would you agree that when you are asleep, you are asleep? And when you are awake, you are awake? James said, yeah. Would you agree that those are two different states? People who don't believe are walking dead. They are asleep. And this is the awakening. And I remember hearing that and thinking, that, that is an accurate description of biblical theology when it comes to salvation. What Kanye is saying is true. That is true. That's what the Bible exactly says. That the conversion is one of coming from dead to life and, and from being asleep to being awake. And it is the work of God that just that makes it happen. And what Kanye was saying, this is what's happening in my life. And at the time, I remember thinking, man, that's, that's amazing. I hope and pray that it's true. But sadly, over the years, uh, if you know what's happened in Kanye's life, everything seems to have fallen apart. Now, far be it from any of us to, to, to think that we know what's going on in someone's heart or someone's faith. But if you were a friend of Kanye, if you were a believer, you, you would probably lately been, been very concerned for his soul because of the, the comments he's making, anti-Semitic comments, his marriage is falling apart, all sorts of things are falling apart. And, and it comes to the place of, of being doubtful. And again, the point isn't to be able to proclaim who, who is saved and who is not. The, the point is, if there's a genuine spiritual awakening, the kind that he is describing, it will It will last that there will be a persevering of the faith, that, that we won't fall back asleep, and that what Jesus has accomplished for us here on, on the cross, we see evidence of in this century in the same thing, that if it's real, that it will be something that is revealed in his entire life. And so as we see the death of Jesus, what we should be thinking to ourselves is praise, praise Jesus for all that he accomplished. Praise Jesus that now it is possible for any human being, by the grace of God, by the power of God, to go from death to life, to, to go from being asleep to being awake. But if that is real, then we will see evidence of it until the end. That's always the call of the Bible. That, that, that we, would, we would have that experience, praise God for it, but it's not just that. It's not just at the campfire 10 years ago at camp. It's not just... Uh, at our bedside when we're six years old. That, that, that's great and fantastic, and clearly God can do that. Look at, this, look at this soldier who moments ago was mocking Jesus, and now he's praising him. Something is going on. The Spirit moves in a very tangible way, but if it is real, it will be lasting. And so instead of looking back, is what I'm saying, we should look at the present and be asking ourselves, God, am I awake? Are, are there areas where I'm falling asleep? Are there areas where I'm taking for granted all that you've done? Like, honestly, if, if Jesus accomplished everything that we need at the cross, if we're looking at it right now, then don't you think everything should change for us? That our entire lives should be transformed? That, that, that our sense of self, our sense of understanding of who God is, who we are, and how we live, everything should be transformed. Because everything is different. Because of what he did. And so my hope for us as we approach this Easter week, is that these truths would both lift us up, but, but lift us up in a sober way, where we see that we shouldn't take any of this lightly, and yet we should walk forward in boldness, in joy. We should move out into the world with that same sense of boldness and joy, that, that Christ has done everything necessary for our, our sins to be taken care of, for the anger of God to be dealt with, for access of God, to be achieved and that there's spiritual awakenings that are happening in our lives and the people the lives of the people around us and we get the joy of being a part of it so as we close I'm going to pray I'm going to pray that this 
would grip our hearts, that we would seek to be faithful in it, and that we would want to see more and more people experience the things that the centurion is experiencing here and all that Christ has done. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your death, for your willing sacrifice, that, that, that no one took your life from you, you gave it up willingly. You, you declared boldly and with victory as you de- gave your spirit over to the Father that, that, it was, that it was done. And Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for doing all the things that we could never do. We thank you that now we can live uh, without the, the weight of condemnation upon us, without the weight of judgment, but we can live freely. We can, we can walk freely into, into the presence of God. I pray, Lord, that we would live that way. I pray, Lord, if there's anything that's, that we feel weighted down by or we feel disapproved of or we feel uh, we see things wrongly about ourselves, God, would you remind us of the truth here? That, God, you love us deeply. And I pray that the awakening that has begun for those of us who have faith would endure to the end. I want to pray for Kanye West, Lord. I don't know him, obviously. Lord, I I pray, though, for his soul. I pray that this season might be a humbling for him, that he might truly understand who you are, Jesus is King, and that he would be saved. And I pray for for all of those, or many of us, who go through those seasons of of slipping back into the the darkness, into the sin that we were once a part of. Lord, I, I pray that we would not lose our way. And by that, I mean that you would hold us fast. For it is not because of our wisdom that we come to you. It's because you seek and save the lost. And so, Lord, would you encourage us in that? Would you you bring us to the point of confession and conviction? And Lord, would you also lay upon our hearts, Lord, the, the names and the faces of those around us that we know that are lost in sin? Lord, it would be our greatest joy this Easter season to have people sitting in this room who haven't heard of you. And Lord, that you would save them. And I pray that right now, Lord, for anyone who is here and not saved, God, would you awaken their hearts truly, bring them to the point of confession. May they have the joy of knowing you today. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.